So quite a few of you are interested in solid state uh, circuits because they are simple and they are safe. Simple and safe. Solid state. But uh, the interest in vacuum tube technology has been growing and this interest is driven by nostalgia and the mystique of the vacuum tube. Also, we've got millions, literally millions of vacuum tubes that are going to waste right now. And why don't you grab one and try to make a circuit out of it? Now, I've been showing you ways of powering these tube circuits using stacks of batteries like this, but these batteries are quite expensive. So, um, some of you have suggested to use uh, lithium ion rechargeable 9 volts. That way you get to use them over and over again uh, for your B plus supplies. That's a great idea, by the way. And others uh, got uh, interested when I mentioned that you could use these simple wall warts that were kind of designed for printers and other things that need a little bit higher voltage between 24 and say 60 volts. So there's all kinds of surplus switching power supplies that usually go to a landfill. Let's reuse those on some of these tube projects. Now there's a third camp that wants to run everything on 12 volts with tubes. But I can tell you that these small tubes were not designed to run on 12 volts. Maybe you can make them work on 12 volts, maybe you can't. It takes some trickery and a lot of feedback, especially if you're doing a regenerative circuit, to get these things to operate at very low voltages. So that's just making life harder for you on your first tube projects. Better to use something like 30, 40, or 50 volts as the B plus on these tubes. So this is a little uh, power uh, video that I'm doing for you guys and we're going to go through how to maybe utilize some of these switching supplies as the B plus and I will also cover the A battery or the battery used to light up the filaments on the tubes. Hope you enjoy this uh, power oriented video. So 100 years ago portable radios came into the mainstream with the advent of the dry cell battery. This is a 36 volt switcher for a Kodak printer. Let's plug this in and see what this sounds like. Okay. We're definitely hearing some noise. And it looks like we have even more ripple with this guy. Oh yeah, this guy. This guy's pretty nasty. Most tube and radio amplifier circuits required an A battery to light the tubes and a B battery for the plate. They also required a C battery to set the bias to class A or B or in the case of a high level RF amplifier, class C. With the advent of cathode biasing uh, with indirectly heated tubes, the C battery was finally disposed of. There were other clever ways of producing bias, replacing the C supply by careful voltage divider and ground reference tricks, as I did with my battery amplifier project. We should probably discuss the A supply first. What is the A supply? That's the power that it takes to light up the filament of the tubes so they'll have emission of electrons and such. This is the basis of most vacuum tube operation. Current flow in one direction and controlling it to produce amplification. There are plenty of books, articles, and videos on thermionic emission, tube theory, and so on. So I'll let you guys take that off to the side. So okay, we need to light the tube. First check the data sheet and see what the tube needs for optimum operation. For instance, a 6C4 seems to want 6 volts at 150 milliamps. A 1U5 wants to have 1.5 volts at 50 milliamps. A standard alkaline C cell has 8,000 milliamp hours of capacity. This means that the battery stack of four cells producing 6 volts should provide more than 50 hours of playtime with that 6C4. Alternatively, a simple 6 volt wall wart, uh, you know, it's an indirectly heated tube, 
it has a cathode uh, 6.3 volt transformer could be used when we're using a directly heated tube like that old type 30 or the 1U4 or the 1U5 um, you can certainly use batteries uh, you can use uh, DC supply uh, what about AC on directly heated tubes like the 1U4 and the 3V4 AC can also be used but a balance system with the center tap is usually required to manage the possible hum or the AC must be rectified to produce DC as with those uh, really popular AC DC portables that used battery tubes you remember the Zenith transoceanic or some of those portable Grundigs of the 1950s those used battery tubes but they also ran on the AC line when we get to the B battery okay the B battery that's the one that goes to the plate traditionally transformer based linear supplies were favored typically voltages were between 45 and you know a little over 100 volts for battery tubes and between 100 and 250 volts uh, for regular cathode tubes like the 6C4 and all the 6 volt tubes that you're familiar with so attempting to run them on very low voltages where they're not characterized or have data taken can produce unpredictable operation gain or frequency response might fall off drastically with regen circuits some of this can be recovered by Q multiplication but you never get all of it back at low voltage I want to also talk about the less discussed C battery the C supply class A circuits required a slightly negative bias on the grid compared to the filament in order to center the operation point so signals could be amplified linearly without clipping ground or clipping the positive rail as with solid state we call this centering on the load line with tubes this typically required a slight negative voltage originally this was provided by a small C cell of negative 1 to negative 5 volts DC negative 1.5 volts is typical uh, for those modest B voltages between 45 and 60 volts for instance originally this was actually another battery the C battery fortunately very little current was required so like your computer's clock battery the C bias cell lived for many years in back of the radio or actually inside the radio by the early 30s a more clever way of synthesizing this bias became popular that is by using a voltage divider circuit and raising the filament to a reference point above the B plus negative terminal or ground or zero volt point this forced the grid which was referenced to that ground to see the cathode as positive to see the filament as positive thus the grid was negative in respect to the filament this is the technique used in the shortwave portable I showed you and in the two valve battery amplifier that we've been using throughout the uh, radio series note that only the power amplifier stage required this bias treatment the lower level stages get negative bias through the grid leak means or possibly through an automatic gain control method which produces a negative voltage signals are much lower in those stages and biasing is less critical up front so only a, a, a swing of maybe a couple of volts on the load line is required for those low level RF stages and the low level audio stages so out of a B plus of say 50 volts uh, you don't need to be perfectly centered at 25 volts for those low level stages but you might want to be pretty close to centered for your power amplifier stage when the cathode came along which separated the filament supply completely from the circuit a new form of producing class C bias arrived it's called cathode bias this simple idea is like a voltage divider as well but it simplifies down to a resistor in the cathode of the usually the power amplifier tube this is sometimes bypassed by a large capacitor for maximum gain although it may be left off if negative feedback is desired in the stage this lowers distortion so tubes with cathodes or indirectly heated tubes such as the 6C4 are easier to work with and, and it's easier to control hum because of that separated cathode from the filament so now we only have the B supply and the A supply to worry about 
Most tube portable required only these two batteries, usually 1.5 volts or 3 volts for the filaments, and 45 to 67 volts for the B battery. So we have a uh, switching power supply here. This guy is a 30 volt supply. And it's got a little whistle that you hear in the speaker. And, uh, he said for a successful and if you look at the scope, you can see that uh, there's definitely some, some noise on the DC. This is normal uh, with switching power supplies because usually there's further filtering in the printer or the computer or whatever it's powering. So I'm on the one microsecond per division, so this is like a, a two and a half microsecond period between those big spikes. And this is the ripple. I mean, if we look at this as a DC voltage, okay, here's ground, put ground down here, and this is one volt, 10 volts. There's 30, right? 10, 20, 30 volts. Looks pretty good, right, when you're looking at just the DC and not paying much attention. But once you put it into AC, I'll put it up here where we can look at it, and you start to increase things, you can see that, yeah, there's definitely some noise and ripple in there. Let's look at another switcher. Let's see what another this switcher is. This is a 36-volt switcher for a Kodak printer. Let's plug this in and see what this sounds like. Okay, we're definitely hearing some noise. Oh yeah, this guy, this guy's pretty nasty. He actually has a similar duty factor. Looks to be almost three microseconds. But yeah, he's nasty. Okay, our third switcher is a little 24 volt job. And this guy is uh, half an amp. Now, we're not using anywhere near half an amp. This uh, particular setup with the four tubes is drawing less than 10 milliamps on the B+. So, it's not a matter of current. It's the cleanliness of the voltage that's important. So let's plug this guy in. Okay, now the little guy, um, actually less noise, but of course less output too because he's only 24 volts. And you can see that uh, he has less ripple as well. So this 24 volt supply seems like it's uh, a good candidate to maybe modify. Perhaps we could figure out how to take this little guy and uh, change his output voltage to something higher. So that's a little bit of an advanced project with this. For starters, we just want to be able to clean up these supplies and use them as is. But in the advanced course, we want to actually change the voltage of these switchers to something more appropriate. You know, like 35 volts to 45 volts instead of 24 volts. By the way, you may be wondering how I can tell what is what. And, uh, you know, both of these wires are black. How do I know which one is the positive and which one is the negative? I don't know if you can see it, but can you see how one of these wires has stripes and the other is just black? The striped wire generally is the positive lead. Okay, so they're kind of hard to see, but there are stripes right there. If you can see those white stripes, those represent the positive lead. Okay, we're back to our... Kodak 37 volt, 36, 37 volt job with the big ripple and the big spikes. Let's try to get this cleaned up. Tongue and shoulder. 
That's right. He told him he was going to sell it for a $25,000 loss. And then he remembered he put an $8,000 charger in the garage. So, needless to say, he isn't around time. So, um, we now have the low-pass filter, brute force filter on the switcher. As you can see on the scope, it's clean as a whistle at the most sensitive uh, scale on the scope. And we're getting good output because this is 36 or 37 volts. I, I decided to go on a tour like this guy did, like, uh, like for instance. Courage, the toleration of idolatry and immorality. Whatever way it was working out in this church, the doctrine of Belem and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and well, Putin's threatening nuclear weapons. He's moved tactical nukes into Belarus. I said, yeah, because we've allowed that to happen. They've allowed that to happen. But you know what? There are other countries that have nuclear weapons also. And that should be... Nice and quiet. Well, I actually stole these parts off this old ATX power supply. You can see this big capacitor, which is 1,000 microfarads at 200 volts. There were a pair of them on this supply. Uh, the Mylar caps are typical on these supplies as uh, input protection. And the uh, big yellow core type, you know, inductors, these usually already have windings on them. You can probably use them pretty much as is. Uh, if you don't happen to have these types of boards to take apart, let's say you've only got your hands on, you know, little inductors like this. You know, these are, this one looks to be about, you know, probably a one millihenry choke. Just a simple 10 cent choke. Here's a uh, uh, 47 microhenry choke. Yeah, use what you got. And remember, you're going to follow that up with a couple of capacitors. Uh, here's an electrolytic. It's a 470 at 63 volts. 470 microfarads at 63 volts. That'll work fine. And here's a, uh, a 0.47 mylar cap. Perfect. So use what you have. Remember, you're going to be doing filtering it doesn't have to be perfect parts. It's going to make such a strong low-pass filter that it's going to take the edge off all of these switchers, especially at the very low currents we're talking about. We only need to take 10 or 20 milliamps off these supplies that are designed for half an amp to probably two amps. They're hardly even going to feel the, uh, the load that we're putting on them. So filtering is going to be very, very easy. We've completely cleaned it up. Now I haven't had to resort to ferrite beads. If you're using just the ferrite rod antenna on this thing, and you're doing it indoors, you may need to do things like that. But if you're using an external antenna, normally you, you should be okay with the switcher with just this amount of filtering. I don't know about you, but I loved rating parts off this ATX power supply board that was going to go to the landfill anyway and coming up with a simple filter for these switching power supplies that can effectively get rid of any ripple or hum or uh, interference that's coming down the DC line. Of course we do have to remember there are RF radiation concerns here also. So using a shielded metal box as well as ferrite beads on the input and output cords is that last bit of improvement you can put on any switching power supply.